Today's webinar, 2016 IEC 61511, how does it impact you? My name is Ted Stewart. I am the Program Development and Compliance Manager here for Exida. I wear a lot of different hats. I am the OEM product certification, or I help manage that. I assist the end user business. I manage the CFSC program, and I'm also the Deputy Quality Manager uh, here within Exit. I have, a, like I said, a lot of different hats. My expertise is in safety and high availability uh, automation systems. I work for Harris Corporation and Lockheed Martin as a, a manufacturing engineer, and uh, I love lean process improvement. I see a lot of new names on today's uh, webinar on the list here, and so we always like to start with a few refresher slides so that you can learn a little bit about Exida. We are a worldwide company. You're going to see a little red dot somewhere pretty close to where you live in the world. Uh, every year, it seems like we're getting more and more dots, which is very exciting for us. Even our corporate office here in Pennsylvania has expanded probably four times in size just over the last few years. Now, Exida, it's involved with the complete supply chain of functional safety in multiple industry sectors. Anywhere from the original equipment manufacturers who require product certification through to the end users that will use that product. Okay, Now, Exida, we're the ones that provide the software tools, the training, the consulting, and procedures related to functional safety, uh, security, and also reliability. In front of you is uh, our suite of different products and services that we offer. Today, as you know, we're going to be speaking about the IEC 61511 uh, standard, uh, and that one will fall under consulting. We also have engineering tools such as CyberFax, Excellentia, Sil Alarm, Silstat, uh, anything that you need to know in functional safety that requires a calculation. We went ahead and made a tool so that you don't have to worry about the equations and doing anything manually. So it's it's quite nice. Uh, we also have product certification. This is something that I would deal with almost day in, day out, uh, where we have IC61508 certification. You're going to learn a little bit about cybersecurity certification. And then, of course, we have training. We have a training somewhere in the world. At least every single week, somewhere in the world, we will hold a training, uh, which is very exciting. The reference material, I, I feel as though this is something that we take very, very serious, and the reason for that is being an accredited uh, company and doing this work, anything that is not public knowledge, we cannot share with people, right? Because then that's impartial and that's giving other people uh, uh, an advantage. Well, what we used to do, and, or what we, 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 excuse me, what we do now is because we, we publish everything, we're an open book, there's nothing that we don't know that you don't know uh, in a reference material way. And so we publish everything. Everything that you need to know, it's out there. It's in a book. So if you have a question or something, we can point you to that, that book, to that section, and then that's how we can help you in that way. We also, of course, have the CFSC program. We have a cybersecurity program. And then, as you see, all the different specialties down there. And I actually will touch a little bit about uh, the CFSC program because IEC 61511 changed in a way that now supports more of the personal competency. IEC 61508, it's an international performance-based standard for all industries, right? So it's what we like to say it's an umbrella standard. You can take that standard, you can break it down to the other standards like IEC 61513, which is for nuclear. You see it at the top. And then we, can, we also have IEC 61511 for the process industry sector. And today, of course, you're going to see that even the 61508 standard has a new addition in 2010. And now we have a new standard for IEC 61511, which is the 2016 uh, release. You will see that online you can get a red line copy so you can see what exactly changed. Today is kind of like a cheat sheet with the cliff notes. I'm going to help and point out the, what I feel are the most important changes within that standard. And I know some people you are already going to ask me, was it a formally released? Well, in two weeks, I can answer that question. I'm going to the ISA 84 committee meeting, and uh, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to figure out where it currently stands. Throughout this presentation, we're going to be discussing the potential benefits. Some of the ones that I, that I came up with are already uh, 
consultations that we have done with some of our clients is we're noticing a reduced operational expense. Uh, and this is compared to the older methods, which dictated that fixed proof test intervals. We're noticing a reduced capital expense uh, you know, on new projects compared to the older prescriptive design rules. When I say capital expense, I know a lot of people, top management's budgets, they really don't even, <laughs> they don't really necessarily care about that capital expense. They're more concerned about the longevity of the product and the overall maintenance and, and cost of that nature. Uh, however, we are seeing a reduced capital expense. We see a much better reduced risk cost for systems that are well implemented and maintained. And I think that's the key point, that are well implemented and maintained. And what am I saying there is there are some great companies out there, and there's also some companies that just want a sticker. <laughs> and uh, those that do it right, you will absolutely see a risk lowered. Your, your risk will be lowered and your cost will be lowered because you don't have to worry about as much. And, of course, you will see fewer false trips, and we will go into that as well. And one moment while I do this, if you do have any questions... Let me see if I can find my question toolbar. I will answer them for you as I go through. All right, I did have a, a small issue with not being able to hear. I'm glad you can hear me now. And uh, I will be getting to your FSM question here throughout the presentation, so bear with me. Thank you for asking. What does the, a typical life cycle look like? Well, the graph in front of you, it will, this shows you the life cycle of a product. People will spend, rough, and these are all rough numbers, keep it simple, 20 weeks or so on the analysis phase of the life cycle. Then when they have their product a little further along, they go to the realization phase, roughly 20 months. So now you're looking at a little over two years or about two years into this product. And, of course, the majority of a product's lifetime is when it's out in the operational phase. And it makes sense that a lot of people want to start focusing on the operational phase. And that's exactly what this new standard is doing. You're going to see a lot of changes um, in the FSM where it is going to become a, a, a more of a mandatory check in the operational maintenance, in maintenance area. And like I said, I'll get to that here in just a couple slides. Pretty common slide here. This is basically stating uh, your hardware reliability and your de design reliability. There's two fundamental concepts here. The probabilistic performance, base system design, which is your FMEDA, your random failures, and then you also have your, your safety lifecycle detailed engineering process, which is systematic and more generic uh, process oriented. For, you, for those of you that aren't familiar with the safety life cycle, because I'm going to say that word a lot, <laughs> here is what I'm talking about. This in front of you is the safety life cycle for IEC 61511. When I spoke about those 20 weeks, that's in that analysis phase. You have the concept. You have your feeds. You're going to be implementing your, uh, your SIS safety requirement specification. This is where the initial let's get it going. And then once you have the concepts and everything built in, you're going to move to the realization phase. And in this phase, that's when you want to design, you want to build, you want to test, you want to install and validate, right? Uh, this is where everything goes on, uh, and that's why it takes about 20 weeks because you're going to have some trial and error, and it's all dependent on how well you have your system in place, and this is where the cost savings will happen because it's so much cheaper to fix something at the beginning than to fix something at the end or fix something that's already out there uh, in other people's hands. Um, and so then after that, of course, you go into the operational phase. This is where roughly 20 years or so goes on, and this is when some things change in the standard. Functional safety is not just about a safety instrumented protective systems and instrumentation. It's functional safety is about culture. It's about how do how do you design, how do you engineer, you know, how are you gonna document everything? How are you going to test? How are you going to operate? And how are you going to maintain a SIS? It's all about competency and the ongoing process of people, about organizations, about procedures and equipment. Therefore, as you see in front, this is not a prescriptive uh, standard. This is a performance standard. Okay, End users are typically not looking for that certification. They're looking more for um, the consulting, the guidance. Right? 
and, you, and of this standard, there's going to be three separate sections. Then the requirements, you're going to have guidelines, and then you have sales selection. Here are today's talking points. These are the bolts that I'm going to briefly talk uh, touch on. You're going to see I'm going to talk about the clarifications of prior use requirements. There were some slight changes there. There are some changes on your formal competency requirements for personnel. You have stronger functional safety assessment requirements, right? This is one of the questions that we had. Uh, we had new cyber security requirements, a simplified hardware fault tolerance requirements, all right? And, and no, a lot of people think that's a, <laughs> when, when you see how they've, they've lessened, it, no, it does not mean it's a get out of jail free card. Uh, there are some other criteria now that you will have to meet and justify. It's all about justifying. This standard was was pretty complex. It actually had more questions than answers. And no, we were not involved in the creation of this new update. We had nothing to do with it. And we just want to, this is a great time actually for me to give kudos to those who were on the board of 61511, who worked on the standard, who made these changes because Exa couldn't agree more. We're extremely happy with these updates, and it's exactly the path that we were taking with all of our clients. So anyone that's worked with us is already way ahead of the game for this new standard. I put this slide in here for prior use justification because there's a lot of confusion. A lot of people think that A, application suitability, and let's call it B1, right? Safety, integrity, prior use justification. People feel that this is the same thing in everybody's head, and it's definitely not the case. I just want to stress that when you want to put something together, the application suitability is, is not the same thing as safety, integrity. Safety, integrity is so much harder, and that's why so many people choose to go the certification route. When you, when you develop anything, make sure you choose your application suitability and then you focus on, let's call it B1 or B2, all right? And there's some points there. Remember, you're going to get these slides, so you don't have to take too many notes here. Just listen to what I have to say, and then you can go back and once you get these slides and go through with everything. But you can say here, you know, B1 prior use justification, demonstrating the SIL capability of a device based on previous operating ex experience in a similar operating environment okay and I'll, I'll read the last one here just because you know for the sake of time although many items are listed which must be included in the ev evidence of the suitability few specific details of what is significant for a given sale provided and that's where some confusion happens and that's why this new standard 61511 and, and it cleans up uh, a lot of those questions that we had prior talking a little bit about uh, competency. What's kind of neat is the shoulds are becoming shalls. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. If you see here the old standard of 61511, it said that you're only required that individuals be competent to carry out the activities for which they are accountable. Well, that's all good and that's a great starting block. But the committee did one more better, and now they're saying that it requires a list of specific items to be addressed and documented when considering the competency of those involved in the safety life cycle activities. Right? So that's taking it to a whole nother level. That's making sure and reassuring that those people that are working in the positions they have for a product or for a, uh, a system that needs the competency, we now have the records, we now have it documented, and we now can show justification as to why they are allowed to be doing what they're doing. And I love it. Uh, and uh, you know, and also there's a procedure that must also be in place to manage the competency of those involved in the safety life cycle. The shoulds are now shalls. They're not, you know, and, and that's another great point of uh, what we've been doing for so long with the CFSC program. Everything now is lining up. Everything is now catching up to what we've already been doing. And like I said, it's it's just been fantastic. And if you need more information about these, any of these topics, uh, each topic could be its own webinar. Right? So I'm only just going to scratch the surface uh, until more people ask more questions, and then at that point, maybe we can bring another webinar on a section that might not be easily understood. Because we, because we don't have too much time, we do get questions about the different types of programs, and uh, now that IC61511 is supporting and is uh, really pushing on personnel competency, we threw one or two slides in here about 
uh, personnel competency, you'll notice that there's different types of programs. I don't need to read everything to you. Um, but there's a certificate program and there's a certification. Obviously, the certification program is one for the mentors, for the leaders, for those that really want to show themselves in the industry as someone that they can be trusted and that they know the information. Right? That's a certification program. There's no training required. If you ever took a course or if you ever uh, with any agency and they said, you must take this training and then you can take the exam, that is called a certificate program. All right, what they're saying is within that four-day, three-day training program, if you listen, if you pay attention, if you understand the concepts, you take an exam at the end. When you pass, you get that certificate. Would you say that you're an expert in three to four days? <laughs> so that's why the difference there, that's why certification is so much more hard. It's so much harder. We call it the gold standard. You know, if you become a CFSC or CFSP, you didn't need a training to pass the course. That exam is not based off that training material. Sure, it'll help you. It's a refresher, but by any means, those trainers have no idea what's going to be on that exam, and that's the true difference between the two. I, I see a question here. It says for both question for both cases, uh, I I meant old and new standard. The individual should be a CFSC or CFSP. Oh, so what you're asking is, the, the question was asked that for the old and the new standards, uh, is it, I guess, is it required uh, that an individual needs to be a CFSC or CFSP? And the answer is no. Uh, you do not need to be a CFSC or CFSP, but that's also kind of saying, you know, if you're going to a facility, let's just talk in a manufacturing facility, uh, and they have a 9001 certificate, you already know the things that they went through to get that, to achieve that certificate, and that's kind of the same thing with the CFSC or CFSP. If you have a CFSC or CFSP next to your name and that signature, or when you have that resume and you hand it to somebody, say for maybe the same job or to show your boss, uh, it holds that credit, right? It, it holds that, uh, um, how do I say it? Basically, it, it can almost omit you from having to show all these other justifications because simply that those initials and showing that certificate proves that you that you have that justification because you've already gone through the rigor, right? So you can, it, it'll help you overcome any other justification that you need because of the standard that it holds and the credibility that it has. So I hope that kind of answers your question. If it didn't, I'll give you my email at the end of this presentation and go ahead and ask some more questions, but I hope that helped. Of course, there's different types of exams that you can take. Uh, when you become an expert, you don't have to be an expert in everything. You know, you could be in process safety, machine, automotive. Uh, even if you're a software engineer or software development, we have an exam for you, and you're going to see more and more cybersecurity. That is a hot topic. That is something that more and more companies are coming to us to, and IEC 61511 is, is right there, right next to it, and you'll see that there are now requirements for cybersecurity as well. Okay, let's get back. Uh, to some of the other points and changes within this uh, program. Now, if a supplier makes any functional safety claims for a product or service, which are used by the organization to demonstrate compliance with the requirements of IC 6105, the, the supplier now shall have a functional safety management system. All right? A lot of times before it was should, but now it's a shall. Okay? The emphasis on planning FSAs... Um, all notes in the edition one are now shalls in edition twos. Okay, so what that means is now the FSA shall be carried out as a minimum prior to the hazards being introduced, right? And we call that stage three. And then if you keep going, the periodical FSA shall be carried out during the maintenance and operational life cycle phase. And that's what answers one of the questions that we got here. They are now shall, so it's going to be periodical, right? You have to have it defined. But now, when you're in the operational maintenance life cycle phase, you must complete an FSA, right? These shall consider the impact analysis during the MOC, and the FSA is depending on time and operation. Uh, and, and quickly, just because I, I know I always get this question uh, for some of the newer guys, you know, what is an what is a FSA? What is a functional safety assessment? Well, the functional safety assessment, it's it's the critical activity that basically ensures that functional safety has actually been achieved 
based off these appliances and uh, you know with all these different relevant clauses of the standard. And those that are carrying out the functional safety assessment these people have to be competent, so they always have. They already have to prove their competency before they even can give an FSA, okay? And they should have the adequate independence, right? So it needs to be a third party, uh, or at least something, someone that has, you know, that has no uh, biased opinion. They have to be impartial, and they shall consider the activities carried out and the outputs obtained during each phase of every life cycle and judge. The extent to which the objective and requirements of IC 65508, you know, have been carried out. So that's what it is. That's what an FSA is. It ties into 65508. Just make sure you don't switch what an audit is compared to an assessment, because uh, the main difference between an audit and assessment is an audit. There's no, no there's no judgment, right? An audit is just you check the box. Uh, do you have this document? Check the box. Uh, do you have yellow lines on your floor? Check the box. Uh, do you have safe areas? Check the box. An assessment. That's when judgment comes into play. All right, that's when uh, that's when you know an assessment can span several organizations, and the FSA activities can actually drill down to those technicalities, right? So you get a more in-depth uh, review if you have an assessment. So that's kind of the difference there. The functional safety assessment. I'll tie in a little bit more. I know I keep talking about it because this is one of the bigger changes. The other one is going to be in the heart or the hardware fault tolerance. But now, reading these slides here, you know, it's to combine the requirement for operation and maintenance of the FSM with requirements for collection and documentation of instrumentation failure performance. What's happening now because of this new standard is companies are now going out getting these formal third-party operations and maintenance FSM audits. Right, a caught an audit, including failure data gathering processes, and this is key because this standard is now geared more towards collecting that failure data. Right, they want real failure data. They do not want the manufacturer's warranty data. They do not want that information. They want the end user failure data because that is true data. Okay, uh, and, and because of all of this, we've had to develop. So many other tools, and and one of the one of the great papers uh, just this past April uh, was done by Julie Brankowski and Lauren Stewart on quantifying the impact of human factors on functional safety. Uh, this is an, a fantastic white paper. Uh, it, it's just sitting right there on our website. So if you want to get a copy and just kind of you know breeze through it, uh, go ahead. Uh, you can print it out and leave it by your desk. Uh, but a uh, fantastic fantastic white paper. But getting back to um, what I was speaking about, because now we're doing more third-party operation and maintenance FSMs, we developed something called a site safety index. And this can actually be used to help improve your PH, your PFH, or your PFD average calculations. We've developed a chart. Now, this chart has five levels. It's called, you know, it's a five levels of site safety index. And this is going to be an excellent year for... Uh, you're going to see these numbers in here right now. It, I think it's called maintenance index capability MCI uh, maintenance capability index. I think is what we have it in there right now. However, it's going to get changed to site safety index, and you'll see here on average, most people are around an SSI two. So when we go and we do an analysis, it's an SSI two, which is fine. You know, it's good. The repairs are correctly performed. Testing is done correctly and mostly on schedule. Most equipment is replaced before end of useful life. And when I want to talk about that, you know, what? How, yeah, maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but think about it. You know, do you always get your repairs done? Are they always done correctly? Is your testing done correctly? Or is it, you know, hey, I might have missed it by a few days. Uh, and, and then, of course, the end of life is really, you know, most people, we see it all the time, they're perfect on all the equipment that they use all the time. They always check it. They always get it before end of useful life. However, there is still equipment probably in that facility that, you know, it might be the outcast. It might not really get all the attention, and therefore it might run out of end useful life, and you'll just repair, replace it whenever you can, and that's fine. However, you know, that's not the best practice. That's not how you're going to get up to an SSI three or SSI four. Uh, we have had many uh, come through at an SSI three. We love it. Uh, we think that's fantastic. That's going to help reduce your failures. And what we're seeing is from different facilities uh, with end users is they have different plants. 
They might have the same equipment installed, but they're both seeing different failures, different failure amounts. And the reason for that is because of this, because it's how, how well is that facility uh, ran. Uh, and, and do they follow their procedures? Are they doing things correctly? And so that's why we're noticing a difference. And that's why people are having us come out and perform these assessments for them so that we can figure out and improve where they're lacking. And, uh, you know, we do have SSI 1 and zeros that we've done. But let's keep that in mind. I don't want to say that's a horrible thing, you know, because it all depends on your application. What are you doing? What is your, your company uh, producing or, you know, what is that manufacturing or what is that area that system's meant for? If it's not going to hurt anybody, maybe you don't have to be so strict. Uh, I'm not saying, uh, you know, not to, but I'm just saying, you know, th there are justifications as to why someone is an SSI 0 and SSI 1. Now, most cybersecurity breaches or implications are actually from unintended errors, right? I mean, you know Stuxnet, you know, where they're bringing in an effective thumb drive, they plug in the computer, and boom, all of a sudden it just, it infiltrates the whole thing. Same thing with an email. Uh, you might open up a funny email and realize, oh, man, that was a, that was a, a virus. There was an attachment on there. It's happening less and less because people are now aware of these things. However, that's not to say uh, there's not going to be new ways of... Uh, impacting an organization through cybersecurity. And IEC 61511 realized this, the committee realized this, they now have a clause 8.2.4, a cybersecurity, or excuse me, a security risk assessment shall be carried out to identify the security vulnerabilities of the SIS. And remember, that's a shall, it's not a should. So that means this is a requirement now that an assessment has to be carried out to identify the security vulnerabilities of the SIS. Now this includes security against both international uh, or excuse me, intentional attacks as well as the unintended errors like we spoke about. Uh, mainly though, it's usually unintended errors. Uh, nobody's really out there to hurt you. It's a, a rare case. Um, it includes the requirements to determine what is needed for the additional risk reduction with respect to the security threats. And of course, one other bold point that I like to make is that the SIS design must provide the necessary resilience against the identified security risks. Here in front of you, uh, I know we spoke about how you know uh, it, it's just very refreshing that the standard did come out because this is stuff that we've been working endlessly and tirelessly to develop. Uh, we had a company here just even last year. Uh, you know the standard was not released then, and we're already working towards meeting the new requirements before it even came out. And here's you know a company Snyder Electric. They went through the process. They actually got their certificate, ISA Secure Security Development Lifecycle Assurance Program. Uh, they have the level one certificate. Kudos to them. But you're going to see this more and more. Many manufacturers are getting their products, uh, their processes, and their systems third-party certified and assessed. And that's, you know, and 61511 is now following suit right behind. This slide here is just kind of just showing you... Uh, that there's several different cybersecurity certificate schemes that are already defined with active products or projects in, in process already. Uh, many people already know about Achilles and World Tech, uh, some of the newer ones uh, that ISA and Exeter are, are working to. Uh, Exeter works with ISA hand in hand, so all of the ISA ones Exeter has had a help in. Mike Medoff is the chairman of the ISA committee. And so, you know, from Exeter, and so he's been really helping out there. But Exeter also has the IC62443, which we've been working on very hard with. And these are now, when you do request that you would like something in cybersecurity, here are the, the standards of the sources that they're going to be based from. Okay, hardware fault tolerance. I know this one uh, brought a few eyebrows up. This one, uh, for us, we love. Um, the new standard 61511, they said no more safe failure fraction. They, they did not see a purpose in it. They didn't see that it was really helping. It was a it was great for the time that we had it, but now we have better things in place. One of those things that we now have placed is Route 2H. Um, if you look at the table in front of you, here's what it says. I'm just going to read through it so you can understand. A SIL 1 in any mode. High demand, low demand, uh, any, HFT can be zero, 
and you can get your SIL 1. If you want a SIL 2 and you have a low demand application, you can still, without any kind of fault tolerance, hardware fault tolerance, you can still do it with zero. If you have a high demand or a continuous mode, you are going to need at least one HFT. Now here's an interesting one that did change for SIL 3. No matter high demand or low demand, even if it's just a simple valve, you cannot have an HFT 0. You must have an HFT 1. That is something completely different. I know there's organizations out there with an HFT 0 at SIL 3. Not to step on anybody's toes, but that's going to go away. Uh, in time, of course. <laughs> Everything is still valid right now. Uh, but uh, just so you know, um, you know, there's no more safe error fraction calculations that is not required anymore. There are going to be some people that are going to try and re go back to 61508 and try and use the old standard and, and go that route. That's up to them. But if you do see someone going back to the safe error fraction and going back to 61508, uh, for me that raises a red flag. I, I kind of want to know why are you going that route? Do you not have the right field failure data? Is there something that uh, that product may or may not be able to do? Um, and that kind of leads me into my next slides where this standard realized what was going on, you know, and, and like I said, we weren't involved in this, but they put in the standard, random failure rate data shall be credible, traceable, documented, and justified. To me, that's common sense. It was such a concern, and the, the committee really feels that even though this is common sense, it must be in there because people are not following this. We, we're seeing bad data everywhere, and, it, it, and that's why we were so excited that this finally is coming out. Uh, you'll, you'll see here in front of you, even this is just on a solenoid valve, right? Pretty basic. You're going to see where Arita, you're going to see where the pipeline companies are, where Dow is, where Exit is. That's pretty common, right? But then you have this other certificate data, all right? Uh, and no, we can't say who that is. <laughs> a lot of people know who it is, but we can't say it. And it's in red because why? That is orders and orders and orders of magnitude lower than everybody else. So something's wrong there. And, and I'll show you one other slide, and I'll explain to you why those numbers are where they are. Here's another one, even an actuator, right? Look at where everybody are is. Uh, you, you got Dow, you got Arita, you got you got Exeter, and then we threw a few more of our points just to show. But on average, we're all pretty close. But then you have those red dots down there again. Same thing. That's scary. That is that is extremely dangerous. And why why are we seeing these things? Well, there's some problem areas, right? And one of those things that we talked about, and a lot of you end users. Uh, will we'll agree with the use of manufacturer warranty data, return data, and shipping records to estimate failure rates. You cannot do this. You cannot base your failure rate numbers from manufacturer warranty return data. I'll tell you, even the last, the very, the, the first webinar I did this morning, one of the guys threw a question and he said, well, you know, well, Ted, of course we don't return anything to the manufacturers. The manufacturer that he was working with, it cost him more to take the item, to get it packaged, to ship it back, to wait for the analysis, to get another one, get it fixed, and then get it shipped back out. He had to pay more money to get something returned than he would just to buy a new one. So guess what? He bought new ones all the time. He never returned a single product. On the other side now, the manufacturers are never seeing returns. Hey, my product is perfect. My failure rates are great. I never see a failure. My product never fails. Now you kind of see why, and you, you're, you're starting to understand why you cannot use manufacturing warranty data to estimate those failure rates. Another thing that we're seeing a lot, and this one is actually everyone's starting to pay attention to, is this B10 uh, type cycle testing. Cycle testing. Uh, more people know about this. Let me quickly explain for it. But basically, this B10 type cycle testing is fine. It's a great way to test for high demand. If you have a product, and I think probably 99%, if not even higher, the people that I'm talking to right now have a low demand system, if your product doesn't need to be used on a daily basis, on a, on a bi-daily basis, if, it's, if your product doesn't move 
on a weekly basis, a bi-weekly basis, a monthly basis, you have a low demand product. Okay, Stiction and other types of friction start, uh, start putting factors into that product if it doesn't move, right? I mean, you might have a valve in, in, sunken in water, and you don't, you don't ever test it for a month or two months at a time. It has a greater chance of failing than something that's always moving. And B10 cycle testing, that's exactly what it does. It tests those products until burnout, right? And so that's how those failure rates are, are uh, factored is they just keep running these things, keep running these things until they fail. And when they fail, they say, okay, here's the failure rate. All right, that's why those two things, they're being used in low demand applications, but they're not applicable to find your failure rates. These two things, I know it sounds like I'm stressing on it because I kind of am, <laughs> have been such a problem that there's now websites like www.sildsafedata.com to where you can now go to as an end user and say, okay, well, this, va this actuator uh, or this valve, oh, I got a triple offset butterfly valve. It just came in at you know, 20 fits, 9 fits. Well, let me look at the, the website. Okay, this valve should actually be between 450 to 750 fits. Why is this only 20 fits? What's going on here? These are, these are the very important things that you should then address that manufacturer, address whoever they supplied you this product, and question. How did you get these numbers? Please show me the facts. If everything checks out, great, awesome. You have a super fantastic, absolutely <laughs> If, but this this helps those who don't know much about functional safety to quickly go to a website and say, okay, why well, no numbers? If something's 500 and the range is 4 to 700, I'm right in there. I'm great. I can check this off. I don't have to worry about it. And so that's why this website has been developed. That's why we've had so many issues in the past that these things are getting developed. And you know, so therefore, these failure rate data limits based are the 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 failure rate data limits are based on a 90% confidence uh, limits. And that's what was published, right? And so that's how these ranges were developed. Uh, you know, we sat with many different organizations to develop these numbers, and uh, it, that this database of different types of products is going to grow and grow and grow to give you that range. So at least you have something to go off of when you see a number. All right, I'll jump off the pedestal on that one. <laughs> All right, let's move into uh, how do you how do you have credible data? You know, the the standard is now asking for justification on credible data and field return information. So how do you say, oh yeah, that's that, this is good. This is good data. This is justified. Well, here's what we do at Exeter, uh, and as I know, we're the only ones right now that do this. Well, when we do our assessments with end users or when we do assessments with manufacturers, we we gather data, right? We now have over 250 billion unit operating hours of field failure data from these process industries. And this number is only going to grow because we keep doing hundreds and hundreds of assessments every single year. We take that information and we, we then calibrate it into, let's call it a, uh, a readable form, and we put it in our books. Why do we put it in books? Because now it's public and we can share it with everybody. We don't want to hide these safety things that we know. We want to share it with everybody so everyone becomes safer. We put them in the books, uh, you know, or we put into our software, Excellentia, right? That's probably the most accurate place. And, and if you don't have Excellentia, these are the benefits of it because that always gets updated at least once a month. Or, you know, on a month, I say, I should say, <laughs> on a monthly basis, Excellentia is reevaluated. It's looked at. The failure rates are adjusted according to the data that we received. We use this information, right? Because if you have a valve, maybe it breaks up into 30 different parts. Well, now you have a failure rate associated with each one of those parts. So when you get a new product in, or when we get a, a similar product, we can now go to this database and pull the failure rates out associated with each one of those components, and that's how that exit FMEDA is created. That's how that analysis is done. Uh, so that's why even a lot of our customers are buying the tool or buying Excellentia because then now they have the information. Now they can look at it, can do their own analysis, so that when they're in that design phase, before they get their product out on the market, they can already figure out what's a what, what components are better than others and build that safe product. All right, so then we have this Fumita. We get the results, and what do we do? We stick it right back into the uh, the product level uh, failure rates per mode, right? So we're now we're actually going to reevaluate 
okay, we did the FEMIDA, now let's reevaluate it with the field data that's still coming in, and now we can explain the differences. We can now adjust where we need to adjust, and now we can explain why things are fail, fail safe, why things are fail dangerous, why things are undetected and detected. Uh, you know, and this is what's going to help you and eliminate even a lot of those spurious trip rates, right? Accurate numbers, you understand, now you can pick a product that has a maybe a lower uh, trip, spurious trip rate than others, and uh, it, it's it's extremely great. It's working very well. Uh, but if uh, one thing that we do spend the most um, reinvest of our money, it's in this. It's in the failure rates. It's in the database. Exa spends a lot of our own money truly to get this right because in the long term, this is what matters, getting those accurate numbers as best as we can, and this is what's important because we do not believe in just giving someone a certificate. A lot of other people do. We want to make sure that if someone were to ask us to do work, we do the best job physically possible in the world. All right. <laughs> more more changes, all right? Um, so now Clause 12. Clause 12, I am so happy the committee changed Clause 12. Clause 12 in the first edition was 17 pages long. It's now only three and a half pages. <laughs> so obviously there was a significantly uh, rewritten, a rewritten portion of this, of this clause. Previously in Clause 12, it covered your life cycle steps and requirements uh, specifications, but has now been moved to more fitting spots and different clauses in that standard that now it makes sense. Uh, this new clause actually reads better. It has more useful information and provides, which is very nice, a longer list of specific items that need to be addressed. You know, so what were considered good and common practice by some are now clearly spelled out. No more guessing, right? We answered more more of those questions. So there's now more answers than questions. And uh, here, an example uh, is, this, you know, for example, the application program and its documentation shall be reviewed by a competent person. Uh, not involved in the original development. The approach used for such a review and the review results shall be documented. I mean, that's just one example of a difference. They didn't state that before, but now it makes sense. Uh, and then another observation um, is that if you are looking still for that old V model diagram of software development and testing, that actually is no longer uh, is the standard. In IEC 61511, in addition to a lot of effort into better defining the requirements for long-term operating and maintenance for performance monitoring was done. Even though the edits, like I said before, appear very subtle, you know, or not very, not very big to some, the practical impact is significant. And now these impacts are based on it's going to be your company's culture. It's going to be on the current position in respect to the new standard and practices to those existing systems. So the standard could impact some, some companies huge or not so much. And if I say it's not so much, it's because they're already doing these things. They've already are ahead of the game. Um, but it's going to be an eye-opener for some other companies. Uh, I hope I helped. I hope I explained the top-level areas that changed in the standard. Uh, we're we're going to work on some white papers. We're going to have some other sessions. But this really just gives you the top level um, guidance of, of the things that were changed. And so, like I said, I hope you found it helpful. Uh, let me look through these questions. I believe I answered everything throughout. Yes, I did. All right, excellent. Well, hey. So uh, we have a lot of people on this call. I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time. You have my email in front of you. You have where the white papers are located. If you can't find something, please, by all means, send me the email. Send me as many emails as you want. I have no problem. I'm always here to help, and uh, we'll be getting through this together. Thanks again. I appreciate everyone's time. Have a great day. Take care for now. Bye-bye.